This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pussycat Mew from Mother Goose in Prose by L. Frank Baum. Pussycat, Pussycat, where do you go? To London, to visit the palace, you know. Pussycat Mew, while you come back again? Oh, yes, I'll scamper with might and with main. Pussycat Mew set off on her way, stepping quite softly and feeling quite gay. Smooth was the road, so she travelled at ease, warmed by the sunshine and fanned by the breeze. Over the hills to the valleys below, through the deep woods where the soft mosses grow, skirting the fields with buttercups dotted, swiftly our venturesome pussy cat trotted. Sharp watch she kept when a village she neared, for boys and their mischief our pussy cat feared. Oft she crept through the grasses so deep to pass by a dog that was lying asleep. Once, as she walked through a sweet clover field, Something beside her affrightedly squealed, and swift from her path there darted away a tiny field mouse with a coat of soft gray. Nowhere, thought our pussy, is chance for a dinner. The one that runs fastest must surely be winner. So quickly she started the mouse to give chase, and over the clover they ran a great race. But just when it seemed that pussy would win, the mouse spied a hole and quickly popped in. And so he escaped, for the hole was so small that Pussy Cat couldn't squeeze in it at all. So softly she crouched, and with eyes big and round, quite steadily watched that small hole in the ground. This mouse really thinks he's escaped me, she said, but I'll catch him sure if he sticks out his head. But while she was watching the poor mouse's plight, a deep growl behind made her jump with a fright. She gave a great cry and then started to run as swift as a bullet that shot from a gun. Meow, meow, our poor puss did say. Bow, wow, cried the dog who was not far away. O'er meadows and ditches they scampered apace, o'er fences and hedges they kept up the race. Then Pussycat Mew saw before her a tree and knew that a safe place of refuge twould be. So far up the tree with a bound she did go, and left the big dog to growl down below. But now, by good fortune, a man came that way and called to the dog who was forced to obey. But Puss did not come down the tree till she knew that the man and the dog were far out of view. Pursuing her way, at nightfall she came to London, a town you know well by name. And wandering round in byway and street, a strange pussy cat she happened to meet. Good evening, said Pussy Cat Mew. Can you tell in which of these houses the queen may now dwell? I'm a stranger in town, and I'm anxious to see what sort of a person a real queen may be. My friend, said the other, you really must know it isn't permitted that strangers should go inside of the palace, unless they're invited. And strange pussy cats are apt to be slighted. By good luck, however, I'm quite well aware of a way to the palace by means of a stair that never is guarded. So just come with me, and a glimpse of the queen you shall certainly see. Puss thanked her new friend, and together they stole to the back of the palace, and crept through a hole in the fence, and quietly came to the stair which the stranger pussy cat promised was there. Now here I must leave you, the strange pussy said. So don't be afraid, cat, but go straight ahead, and don't be alarmed if by chance you are seen, for people will think you belong to the queen. So pussy cat mew did as she had been told, and walked through the palace with a manner so bold. She soon reached the room where the queen sat in state, surrounded by lords and by ladies so great. And there in the corner our pussy sat down, and gazed at the sceptre, and blinked at the crown, and eyed the queen's dress, all purple and gold, which was surely a beautiful sight to behold. But all of a sudden she started, for there was a little gray mouse right under the chair where Her Majesty sat, 
and Pussy well knew she'd scream with alarm if the mouse met her view. So up toward the chair our pussy cat stole, but the mouse saw her coming and ran for its hole, but Pussy ran after, and during the race a wonderful, terrible panic took place. The ladies all jumped on their chairs in alarm. The lords drew their swords to protect them from harm. And the queen gave a scream and fainted away. A very undignified act, I must say. And someone cried, Burglars! And someone cried, Treason! And someone cried, Murder! But none knew the reason. And someone cried, Fire! They are burning the house! And someone cried, Silence! It's only a mouse! But Pussycat Mew was so awfully scared by the shouting and screaming, no longer she dared to stay in the room. So without more delay she rushed from the palace and scampered away. So bristling her fur and with heart beating fast, she came to the road leading homeward at last. What business, she thought, has a poor country cat to visit a city of madmen like that? Straight homeward I'll go, where I am well fed, where mistress is kind, and soft is my bed. Let other cats travel if they wish to roam. But as for myself, I shall now stay at home. And over the hills and valleys she ran, and journeyed as fast as a pussy cat can, till just as the dawn of the day did begin, she safely at home stole quietly in. And there was the fire with the pot boiling on it, and there was the maid in the blue checkered bonnet, and there was the corner where Pussy oft basked, and there was the mistress, who eagerly asked, Pussy cat, Pussy cat, where have you been? I've been to London to visit the queen. Pussy cat, Pussy cat, what did you there? I frightened a little mouse under her chair. End of Pussycat Mew This recording, all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Charlene Harris. Email soundchest at yahoo.com. How the Beggars Came to Town from Mother Goose in Prose by L. Frank Baum. How the beggars came to town. Hark, hark, the dogs do bark. The beggars are coming to town. Some in rags, and some in tags, and some in velvet gown. Very fair and sweet was little Prince Lillimond, and few could resist his soft pleading voice and gentle blue eyes, as he stood in the presence of the king his father, and bent his knee gracefully before his majesty, the act was so courteous and dignified it would have honoured the oldest nobleman of the court. The king was delighted, and for a time sat silently regarding his son and noting every detail of his appearance, from the dark velvet suit with its dainty ruffles and collar, to the diamond buckles on the little shoes, and back again to the flowing curls that clustered thick about the bright childish face. Well might any father be proud of so manly and beautiful a child, and the king's heart swelled within him as he gazed upon his heir. Borland, he said to the tutor, who stood modestly behind the prince, you may retire. I wish to speak privately with his royal highness. The tutor bowed low and disappeared within the anteroom, and the king continued kindly. Come here, Lillimond, and sit beside me. Methinks you seem over grave this morning. "'It is my birthday, Your Majesty,' replied the prince, as he slowly obeyed his father, and sat beside him upon the rich broidered cushions of the throne. "'I am twelve years of age.' "'So old?' said the king, smiling into the little face that was raised to his. "'And is it the weight of years that makes you sad?' "'No, Your Majesty, I long for the years to pass, that I may become a man and take my part in the world's affairs.' It is the sad condition of my country which troubles me. Indeed, exclaimed the king, casting a keen glance at his son. Are you becoming interested in politics then, or is there some grievous breach of court etiquette which has attracted your attention? I know little of politics, 
and less of the court, sire, replied Lillamond. It is the distress of the people that worries me. The people? Of a surety, Prince, you are better posted than I am, since of the people and their affairs I know nothing at all. I have appointed officers to look after their interests, and therefore I have no cause to come into contact with them myself. But what is amiss? They are starving, said the prince, looking at his father very seriously. The country is filled with beggars who appeal for charity, since they are unable otherwise to procure food. Starving? repeated the king. Surely you are misinformed. My lord Chamberlain told me but this morning the people were loyal and contented, and my lord of the treasury reports that all taxes and tithes have been paid, and my coffers are running over. Your lord Chamberlain is wrong, sire, returned the prince. My tutor, Borland, and I have talked with many of these beggars these past few days, and we find the tithes and taxes which have enriched you have taken the bread from their wives and children. So, exclaimed the king, we must examine into this matter. He touched a bell beside him, and when a retainer appeared directed his chamberlain and his treasurer to wait upon him at once. The prince rested his head upon his hand and waited patiently, but the king was very impatient indeed till the high officers of the court stood before him. Then said the king, addressing his chamberlain, Sir, I am informed my people are murmuring at my injustice. Is it true? The officer cast an inquiring glance at the prince, who met his eyes gravely before he replied. The people always murmur, your majesty. They are many, and not all can be content, even when ruled by so wise and just a king. In every land, and in every age, there are those who rebel against the laws, and the protests of the few are ever heard above the contentment of the many. I am told, continued the king severely, that my country is overrun with beggars who suffer for the lack of bread we have taken from them by our taxations. Is this true? There are always beggars, your majesty, in every country, replied the chamberlain, and it is their custom to blame others for their own misfortunes. The king thought deeply for a moment, then he turned to the lord of the treasury. Do we tax the poor? he demanded. All are taxed, sire, returned the treasurer, who was pale from anxiety, for never before had the king so questioned him. But from the rich we take much, from the poor very little. But a little from a poor man may distress him, while the rich subject would never feel the loss. Why do we tax the poor at all? Because, your majesty, should we declare the poor free from taxation, all your subjects would at once claim to be poor, and the royal treasury would remain empty. And as none are so rich, but there are those richer, how should we, in justice, determine which are the rich and which are the poor? Again the king was silent while he pondered upon the words of the royal treasurer. Then with a wave of his hand he dismissed them and turned to the prince, saying, You have heard the wise words of my counsellors, prince. What have you to say in reply? If you will pardon me, your majesty, I think you are wrong to leave the affairs of the people to others to direct. If you knew them as well as I do, you would distrust the words of your counsellors, who naturally fear your anger more than they do that of your subjects. If they fear my anger, they will be careful to do no injustice to my people. Surely you cannot expect me to attend to levying the taxes myself, continued the king with growing annoyance. What are my officers for but to serve me? They should serve you, it is true, replied the prince thoughtfully, but they should serve the people as well. Nonsense, answered the king. You are too young as yet to properly understand such matters, and it is a way youth has to imagine it is wiser than age and experience combined. Still, I will investigate the subject further and see that justice is done the poor. In the meantime, said the prince, many will starve to death. Can you not assist these poor beggars at once? In what way? demanded the king. By giving them money from your coffers. Nonsense! again cried the king, this time with real anger. You have heard what the chamberlain said. We always have beggars, and none as yet have starved to death. Besides, I must use the money for the grand ball and tourney next month, as we have promised the ladies of the court a carnival of unusual magnificence. The prince did not reply to this, but remained in silent thought. 
wondering what he might do to ease the suffering he feared existed on every hand amongst the poor of the kingdom. He had hoped to persuade the king to assist these beggars, but since the interview with the officers of the court he had lost heart, and despaired of influencing his royal father in any way. Suddenly the king spoke. Let us dismiss this subject, Lillemond, for it only serves to distress us both, and no good can come of it. You have nearly made me forget it is your birthday. Now listen, my son, I am much pleased with you, and thank God that he has given me such a successor for my crown, for I perceive your mind is as beautiful as your person, and that you will in time be fitted to rule the land with wisdom and justice. Therefore I promise, in honor of your birthday, to grant any desire you may express, provided it lies within my power. Nor will I make any further condition, since I rely upon your judgment to select some gift I may be glad to bestow. As the king spoke, Lillamond suddenly became impressed with an idea through which he might sister the poor, and therefore he answered, Call in the ladies and gentlemen of the court, my father, and before them all I will claim your promise. Good, exclaimed the king, who looked for some amusement in his son's request, and at once he ordered the court to assemble. The ladies and gentlemen, as they filed into the audience chamber, were astonished to see the prince seated upon the throne beside his sire. But being too well bred to betray their surprise, they only wondered what amusement his majesty had in store for them. When all were assembled, the prince rose to his feet and addressed them. His majesty the king, whose kindness of heart and royal condescension is well known to you all, hath but now promised me, seeing that it is my birthday, to grant any one request that I may prefer. Is it not true, your majesty? It is true, answered the king, smiling upon his son, and pleased to see him addressing the court so gravely and with so manly an air. Whatever the prince may ask, that will I freely grant. Then, O sire, said the prince, kneeling before the throne, I ask that for the period of one day I may reign as king in your stead having at my command all kingly power and the obedience of all who owe allegiance to the crown. For a time there was perfect silence in the court. The king, growing red with dismay and embarrassment, and the courtiers, waiting curiously his reply, Lillamond still remained kneeling before the throne, and as the king looked upon him he realized it would be impossible to break his royal word. And the affair promised him amusement after all so he quickly decided in what manner to reply. "'Rise, O Prince,' he said, cheerfully. "'Your request is granted. Upon what day will it please you to reign?' Lillamond arose to his feet. "'Upon the seventh day from this,' he answered. "'So be it,' returned the king. Then turning to the royal herald, he added, Make proclamation throughout the kingdom that on the seventh day from this Prince Lillamond will reign as king from sunrise till sunset, and whoever dares to disobey his commands will be guilty of treason and shall be punished with death. The court was then dismissed, all wondering at this marvellous decree, and the prince returned to his own apartment where his tutor Borland anxiously awaited him. Now this Borland was a man of good heart and much intelligence, but wholly unused to the ways of the world. He had lately noted with much grief the number of beggars who solicited alms as he walked out with the prince, and he had given freely until his purse was empty. Then he talked long and earnestly with the prince concerning this shocking condition in the kingdom, never dreaming that his own generosity had attracted all the beggars of the city toward him, and encouraged them to become more bold than usual. Thus was the young and tender-hearted prince brought to a knowledge of all these beggars, and therefore it was that their condition filled him with sadness, and induced him to speak so boldly to the king, his father. When he returned to Borland with the tidings that the king had granted him permission to rule for a day the kingdom, the tutor was overjoyed, and at once they began to plan ways for relieving all the poor of the country in that one day. For one thing, they dispatched private messages to every part of the kingdom, bidding them tell each beggar they met to come to the prince on that one day he should be king, and he would relieve their wants, giving a broad gold piece to every poor man or woman who asked. For the prince had determined to devote to this purpose the gold that filled the royal coffers, and as for the great ball and tourney the king had planned, why, that could go begging much better than the starving people. 
On the night before the day the prince was to reign, there was a great confusion of noise within the city, for beggars from all parts of the kingdom began to arrive, each one filled with joy at the prospect of receiving a piece of gold. There was a continual tramp, tramp of feet, and a great barking of dogs, as all dogs in those days were trained to bark at every beggar they saw, and now it was difficult to restrain them. And the beggars came to town singingly, and by twos and threes, until hundreds were there to await the morrow. Some few were very pitiful to behold, being feeble and infirm from age and disease, dressed in rags and tags, and presenting an appearance of great distress. But there were many more who were seemingly hardy and vigorous, and these were the lazy ones, who, not being willing to work, begged for a livelihood. And some there were dressed in silken hose and velvet gowns, who, forgetting all shame and eager for gold, had been led by the prince's offer to represent themselves as beggars, that they might add to their wealth without trouble or cost to themselves. The next morning, when the sun arose upon the eventful day, it found the prince sitting upon the throne of his father, dressed in a robe of ermine and purple, a crown upon his flowing locks, and the king's sceptre clasped tightly in his little hand. He was somewhat frightened at the clamour of the crowd without the palace, but Borland, who stood behind him, whispered, "'The more you can susser, the greater will be your glory, and you will live in the hearts of your people as the king-prince who relieved their sufferings. Be of good cheer, your majesty, for all is well.' Then did the prince command the treasurer to bring before him the royal coffers, and to stand ready to present to each beggar a piece of gold. The treasurer was very unwilling to do this, but he was under penalty of death if he refused, and so the coffers were brought forth. "'Your Majesty,' said the treasurer, "'if each of those who clamour without is to receive a piece of gold, there will not be enough within these coffers to go around. Some will receive, and others be denied, since no further store of gold is to be had.' At this news the prince was both puzzled and alarmed. "'What are we to do?' he asked of the tutor, but Borland was unable to suggest a remedy. Then said the aged chamberlain, coming forward and bowing low before the little king, Your Majesty, I think I can assist you in your difficulty. You did but promise a piece of gold to those who are really suffering and in need. But so great is the greed of mankind that many without are in no necessity whatever, but only seek to enrich themselves at your expense. Therefore I propose you examine carefully each case that presents itself, and, unless the beggar is in need of alms, turn him away empty-handed, as being a fraud and a charlatan. "'Your counsel is wise, O Chamberlain,' replied the prince, after a moment's thought, "'and by turning away the impostors we shall have gold enough for the needy. Therefore bid the guards to admit the beggars one by one.' When the first beggar came before him, the prince asked, "'Are you in need?' "'I am starving, your majesty,' replied the man in a whining tone. He was poorly dressed, but seemed strong and well, and the prince examined him carefully for a moment. Then he answered the fellow, saying, "'Since you are starving, go and sell the gold ring I see you are wearing upon your finger. I can assist only those who are unable to help themselves.' At this the man turned away, muttering angrily, and the courtiers murmured their approval of the prince's wisdom. The next beggar was dressed in velvet, and the prince sent him away with a sharp rebuke. But the third was a woman old and feeble, and she blessed the prince as she hobbled joyfully away with a broad gold piece clasped tightly within her withered hand. The next told so pitiful a story that he also received a gold piece, but as he turned away the prince saw that beneath his robe his shoes were fastened with silver buckles, and so he commanded the guards to take away the gold and to punish the man for attempting to deceive his king. And so many came to him that were found to be unworthy that he finally bade the guards proclaim to all who waited that any who should be found undeserving would be beaten with stripes. That edict so frightened the imposers that they quickly fled, and only those few who were actually in want dared to present themselves before the king and lo, the task that had seemed too great for one day was performed in a few hours, and when all the needy had been provided for, but one of the royal coffers had been opened, and that was scarcely empty. "'What do you think, Borland?' asked the prince, anxiously. "'Have we done all right?' "'I have learned, Your Majesty,' 
answered the tutor, that there is a great difference between those who beg and those who suffer for lack of bread. For, while all who needed aid were in truth beggars, not all the beggars needed aid, and hereafter I shall only give alms to those I know to be honestly in want. It is wisely said, my friend, returned the prince, and I feel I was wrong to doubt the wisdom of my father's counsellors. Go, Borland, and ask the king if he will graciously attend me here. The king arrived and bowed smilingly before the prince whom he had set to reign in his own place, and at once the boy arose and presented his sire with the sceptre and crown, saying, Forgive me, O my king, that I presume to doubt the wisdom of your rule, for though the sun has not yet set, I feel that I am all unworthy to sit in your place, and so I willingly resign my power to your more skilful hands, and the coffers which I, in my ignorance, had determined to empty for the benefit of those unworthy, are still nearly full, and more than enough remains for the expenses of the carnival. Therefore forgive me, my father, and let me learn wisdom in the future from the justness of your rule. Thus ended the reign of Prince Lillamund as king, and not till many years later did he again ascend the throne upon the death of his father. And really there was not much suffering in the kingdom at any time, as it was a prosperous country and well governed, for if you look for beggars in any land you will find many, but if you look only for the deserving poor there are less, and these all the more worthy of Susser. I wish all those in power were as kind-hearted as little Prince Lillamond, and as ready to help the needy, for then there would be light hearts in the world, since it is better to give than to receive. End of How the Beggars Came to Town This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Tom the Piper's Son From Mother Goose and Prose By L. Frank Baum Tom, Tom the Piper's Son stole a pig, and away he run. The pig was eat, and Tom was beat, and Tom ran crying down the street. There was not a worse vagabond in Shrewsbury than old Barney the Piper. He never did any work except to play the pipes, and he played so badly that few pennies ever found their way into his pouch. It was whispered around that old Barney was not very honest, but he was so sly and cautious that no one had ever caught him in the act of stealing, although a good many things had been missed after they had fallen into the old man's way. Barney had one son named Tom, and they lived all alone in a little hut away at the end of the village street, for Tom's mother had died when he was a baby. You may not suppose that Tom was a very good boy, since he had such a queer father, but neither was he very bad, and the worst fault he had was in obeying his father's wishes, when Barney wanted him to steal a chicken for their supper, or a pot of potatoes for their breakfast. Tom did not like to steal, but he had no one to teach him to be honest, and so, under his father's guidance, he fell into bad ways. One morning, Tom Tom the piper's son was hungry when the day begun. He wanted a bun and asked for one, but soon found out that there were none. "'What shall we do?' he asked his father. "'Go hungry,' replied Barney, "'unless you want to take my pipes and play in the village. Perhaps they will give you a penny.' No, answered Tom, shaking his head. No one will give me a penny for playing, but Farmer Bowser might give me a penny to stop playing if I went to his house. He did last week, you know. You'd better try it, said his father. It's mighty uncomfortable to be hungry. So Tom took his father's pipes and walked over the hill to Farmer Bowser's house. For you must know that Tom Tom the piper's son learned to play when he was young, but the only tune that he could play was over the hills and far away. And he played this one tune as badly as his father himself played, so that the people were annoyed when they heard him, and often begged him to stop. When he came to Farmer Bowser's house, Tom started up the pipes, and began to play with all his might. The farmer was in his woodshed sawing wood, so he did not hear the pipes. And the farmer's wife was deaf, and could not hear them, but a little pig that had strayed around in front of the house 
heard the noise and ran away in great fear to the pigsty. Then, as Tom saw the playing did no good, he thought he would sing also, and therefore he began bawling at the top of his voice. Over the hills, not a great ways off, the woodchuck died with a whooping cough. The farmer had stopped sawing to rest just then, and when he heard the singing, he rushed out of the shed and chased Tom away with a big stick of wood. The boy went back to his father and said sorrowfully, for he was more hungry than before, The farmer gave me nothing but a scolding, but there was a very nice pig running around the yard. How big was it? asked Barney. Oh, just about big enough to make a nice dinner for you and me. The piper slowly shook his head. Tis long since I on pig have fed, and though I feel it's wrong to steal, roast pig is very nice, he said. Tom knew very well what he meant by that. So he laid down the pipes and went back to the farmer's house. When he came near, he heard the farmer again sawing wood in the woodshed, and so he went softly up to the pigsty and reached over and grabbed the little pig by the ears. The pig squealed, of course, but the farmer was making so much noise himself that he did not hear it, and in a minute Tom had the pig tucked under his arm and was running back home with it. The piper was very glad to see the pig and said to Tom, You are a good son, and the pig is very nice and fat. We shall have a dinner fit for a king. It was not long before the piper had the pig killed and cut into pieces and boiling in the pot. Only the tail was left out, for Tom wanted to make a whistle of it, and as there was plenty to eat besides the tail, his father let him have it. The piper and his son had a fine dinner that day, and so great was their hunger. That the little pig was all eaten up at one meal. Then Barney lay down to sleep, and Tom sat on a bench outside the door and began to make a whistle out of the pig's tail with his pocket knife. Now Farmer Bowser, when he had finished sawing the wood, found it was time to feed the pig. So he took a pail of meal and went to the pigsty. But when he came to the sty, there was no pig to be seen, and he searched all round the place for a good hour without finding it. Piggy, 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 he called, but no piggy came, and then he knew his pig had been stolen. He was very angry indeed, for the pig was a great pet, and he had wanted to keep it till it grew very big. So he put on his coat and buckled a strap around his waist and went down to the village to see if he could find out who had stolen his pig. Up and down the street he went, and in and out the lanes. But no traces of the pig could he find anywhere. And that was no great wonder, for the pig was eaten by that time and its bones picked clean. Finally, the farmer came to the end of the street where the piper lived in his little hut, and there he saw Tom sitting on a bench and blowing on a whistle made from a pig's tail. Where did you get that tail? asked the farmer. I found it, said naughty Tom, beginning to be frightened. Let me see it, demanded the farmer, and when he had looked at it carefully, he cried out, This tail belonged to my little pig, for I know very well the curl at the end of it. Tell me, you rascal, where is the pig? Then Tom fell in a tremble, for he knew his wickedness was discovered. The pig is eat, your honor, he answered. The farmer said never a word, but his face grew black with anger, and unbuckling the strap that was about his waist, He waved it around his head, and whack came the strap over Tom's back. Ow, ow! cried the boy, and started to run down the street. Whack, whack! fell the strap over his shoulder, for the farmer followed at his heels halfway down the street, nor did he spare the strap until he had given Tom a good beating, and Tom was so scared that he never stopped running until he came to the end of the village. And he bawled lustily the whole way and cried out at every step as if the farmer was still at his back. It was dark before he came back to his home, and his father was still asleep, so Tom crept into the hut and went to bed. But he had received a good lesson, and never after that could the old piper induce him to steal. When Tom showed by his actions his intention of being honest, he soon got a job of work to do. And before long he was able to earn a living more easily, and a great deal more honestly, 
than when he stole the pig to get a dinner and suffered a severe beating as a punishment. Tom, Tom, the piper's son, now with stealing pigs was done. He'd work all day instead of play, and dined on tart and currant bun. End of Tom the Piper's Son Recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Humpty Dumpty from Mother Goose in Prose by L. Frank Baum. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men cannot put Humpty together again. At the very top of the haymow in the barn, the speckled hen had made her nest, and each day for twelve days she had laid in it a pretty white egg. The speckled hen had made her nest in this out-of-the-way place, so that no one would come to disturb her, as it was her intention to sit upon the eggs until they were hatched into chickens. Each day, as she laid her eggs, she would cackle to herself, saying, This will in time be a beautiful chick, with soft fluffy down all over its body, and bright little eyes that will look at the world in amazement. It will be one of my children, and I shall love it dearly. She named each egg as she laid it, by the name she should call it when a chick, the first one being Cluckety-Cluck, and the next Kadaukuk, and so on, and when she came to the twelfth egg, she called it Humpty Dumpty. This twelfth egg was remarkably big and white, and of a very pretty shape, and as the nest was now so full, she laid it quite near the edge. And then the speckled hen, after looking proudly at her work, went off to the barnyard, clucking joyfully in search of something to eat. When she had gone, Cluckety-Cluck, who was in the middle of the nest, and the oldest egg of all, called out angrily, "'It's getting crowded in this nest. Move up there, some of you fellows.' And then he gave Kadakut, who was above him, a kick. "'I can't move unless the others do. They're crowding me down,' said Kadakut, and he kicked the egg next above him. And so they continued kicking one another, and rolling around in the nest until one kicked Humpty Dumpty, and as he lay on the edge of the nest, he was kicked out and rolled down the haymow until he came to a stop near the very bottom. Humpty did not like this very well, but he was a bright egg for one so young, and after he had recovered from his shaking up, he began to look about to see where he was. The barn door was open, and he caught a glimpse of trees and hedges and green grass with a silvery brook running through it. And he saw the waving grain and the tasseled maize and the sunshine flooding it all. The scene was very enticing to the young egg, and Humpty at once resolved to see something of this great world before going back to the nest. He began to make his way carefully through the hay, and was getting along fairly well when he heard a voice say, "'Where are you going?' Humpty looked around and found he was beside a pretty little nest in which was one brown egg. "'Did you speak?' he asked. "'Yes,' replied the brown egg. "'I asked where you were going.' "'Who are you?' inquired Humpty. "'Do you belong in our nest?' "'Oh, no,' answered the brown egg. "'My name is Kuchikulu, and the black bantam laid me about an hour ago.' Oh, said Humpty proudly, I belong to the speckled hen myself. Do you indeed? returned Kuchikulu. I saw her go by a little while ago, and she's much bigger than a black bantam. Yes, and I'm much bigger than you, replied Humpty. But I'm going out to see the world, and if you'd like to go with me, I'll take good care of you. "'Isn't it dangerous for eggs to go about all by themselves?' asked Kuchik timidly. 
"'Perhaps so,' answered Humpty. "'But it's dangerous in the nest, too. "'My brothers might have smashed me with their kicking. "'However, if we are careful, we can't come to much harm. "'So come along, little one, and I'll look after you.' Kuchikalu gave him her hand while he helped her out of the nest, and together they crept over the hay until they came to the barn floor. They made for the door at once, holding each other by the hand, and soon came to the threshold, which appeared very high to them. "'We must jump,' said Humpty. "'I'm afraid,' cried Kuchikulu. "'And I declare, there's my mother's voice clucking. She's coming this way.' "'Then hurry,' said Humpty. "'And do not tremble so, or you will get yourself all mixed up. "'It doesn't improve eggs to shake them. "'We will jump, but take care not to bump against me, "'or you may break my shell. "'Now, one, two, three. "'They held each other's hand and jumped, "'alighting safely in the roadway. "'Then, fearing their mothers would see them, "'Humpty ran as fast as he could, "'until he and Coochie were concealed beneath a rosebud in the garden. "'I'm afraid we're bad eggs,' gasped Coochie, who was somewhat out of breath. "'Oh, not at all,' replied Humpty. "'We were laid only this morning, so we are quite fresh. "'But now, since we are in the world, we must start out in search of adventure. "'Here is a roadway beside us, which will lead somewhere or other. "'So come along, Coochie and do not be afraid. The brown egg meekly gave him her hand, and together they trotted along the roadway until they came to a high stone wall, which had sharp spikes upon its top. It seemed to extend for a great distance, and the egg stopped and looked at it curiously. "'I'd like to see what is behind that wall,' said Humpty, "'but I don't think we shall be able to climb up over it.' "'No, indeed,' answered the brown egg. "'but just before us I see a little hole in the wall, near the ground. "'Perhaps we can crawl through that.' "'They ran to the hole, and found it was just large enough to admit them. "'So they squeezed through very carefully, in order not to break themselves, "'and soon came to the other side. "'They were now in the most beautiful garden, "'with trees and brightly hued flowers, in abundance.' and pretty fountains that shot their merry sprays far into the air. In the centre of the garden was a great palace, with bright golden turrets and domes, and many windows that glistened in the sunshine like the sparkle of diamonds. Richly dressed courtiers and charming ladies strolled through the walks, and before the palace door were a dozen prancing horses, gaily caparisoned, awaiting their riders. It was a scene brilliant enough to fascinate anyone, and the two eggs stood spellbound while their eyes feasted upon the unusual sight. "'See,' whispered Kuchikulu, "'there are some birds swimming in the water yonder. Let us go and look at them, for we may also be birds some day.' "'True,' answered Humpty, "'but we are just as likely to be omelettes, or angels' food. Still, we will have a look at the birds. So they started to cross the drive on the way to the pond, never noticing that the king and his courtiers had issued from the palace, and were now coming down the drive riding upon their prancing steeds. Just as the eggs were in the middle of the drive, the horses dashed by, and Humpty, greatly alarmed, ran as fast as he could for the grass. Then he stopped and looked around, and behold, there was poor Kuchikulu crushed into a shapeless mass by the hoof of one of the horses, and her golden heart was spreading itself slowly over the white gravel of the driveway. Humpty sat down upon the grass and wept grievously, for the death of his companion was a great blow to him. And while he sobbed, a voice said to him, "'What is the matter, little egg?' Humpty looked up and saw a beautiful girl bending over him. "'One of the horses has stepped upon Kuchikulu,' 
he said, and now she is dead, and I have no friend in all the world. The girl laughed. Do not grieve, she said, for eggs are but short-lived creatures at best, and Coochie Kulu has at least died an honorable death, and saved herself from being fried in a pan, or boiled in her own shell. So cheer up, little egg, and I will be your friend, at least so long as you remain fresh. A stale egg I never could abide. I was laid only this morning, said Humpty, drying his tears so you need have no fear. But don't call me Little Egg, for I am quite large as eggs go, and I have a name of my own. What is your name? asked the princess. It is Humpty Dumpty, he answered proudly. And now, if you will really be my friend, pray show me about the grounds and through the palace, and take care I am not crushed." So the princess took Humpty in her arms and walked with him all through the grounds, letting him see the fountains and the golden fish that swam in their waters, the bed of lilies and roses, and the pools where the swans floated. Then she took him into the palace and showed him all the gorgeous rooms, including the king's own bedchamber, and the room where stood the great ivory throne. Humpty sighed with pleasure. After this, he said, I am content to accept any fate that may befall me, for surely no egg before me ever saw so many beautiful sights. That is true, answered the princess, but now I have one more sight to show you which will be grander than all the others, for the king will be riding home shortly with all his horses and men at his back, and I will take you to the gates and let you see them pass by. Thank you, said Humpty. So she carried him to the gates and while they awaited the coming of the king, the egg said, "'Put me upon the wall, princess, for then I be able to see much better than in your arms.' "'That is a good idea,' she answered. "'But you must be careful not to fall.' Then she sat the egg gently upon the top of the stone wall, where there was a little hollow, and Humpty was delighted, for from his elevated perch he could see much better than the princess herself." "'Here they come!' he cried. And, sure enough, the king came riding along the road with many courtiers and soldiers and vassals following in his wake, all mounted upon the finest horses the kingdom could afford. As they came to the gate and entered at a brisk trot, Humpty, forgetting his dangerous position, leaned eagerly over to look at them. The next instant the princess heard a sharp crash at her side, and looking downward, perceived poor Humpty Dumpty, who lay crushed and mangled among the sharp stones where he had fallen. The princess sighed, for she had taken quite a fancy to the egg, but she knew it was impossible to gather it up again, or to mend the matter in any way, and therefore she returned thoughtfully to the palace. Now it happened that upon this evening several young men of the kingdom, who were all of high rank, had determined to ask the king for the hand of the princess. So they assembled in the throne room, and demanded that the king choose which of them was most worthy to marry his daughter. The king was in a quandary, for all the suitors were wealthy and powerful, and he feared that all but the one chosen would become his enemies. Therefore he thought long upon the matter, and at last said, where all are worthy, it is difficult to decide which most deserves the hand of the princess. Therefore, I propose to test your wit. The one who shall ask me a riddle I cannot guess can marry my daughter. At this the young men looked thoughtful, and began to devise riddles that his majesty should be unable to guess. But the king was a shrewd monarch, and each one of the riddles presented to him he guessed with ease. Now, there was one amongst the suitors whom the princess herself favoured, as was but natural. He was a slender, fair-haired youth, with dreamy blue eyes and a rosy complexion, and although he loved the princess dearly, he despaired of finding a riddle that the king could not guess. But while he stood leaning against the wall, the princess approached him, 
and whispered in his ear a riddle she had just thought of. Instantly his face brightened, and when the king called, Now, Master Gracington, for it is your turn, he advanced boldly to the throne. Speak your riddle, sir, said the king, gaily, for he thought this youth would also fail, and that he might therefore keep the princess by his side for a time longer. But Master Gracington, with downcast eyes, knelt before the throne and spoke in this wise. This is my riddle, O king. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men cannot put Humpty together again. Read me that, sire, and you will. The king thought earnestly for a long time, and he slapped his head and rubbed his ears and walked the floor in great strides, but guessed the riddle he could not. "'You are a humbug, sir,' he cried out at last. "'There is no answer to such a riddle.' "'You are wrong, sire,' answered the young man. "'Humpty Dumpty was an egg.' "'Why did I not think of that before?' exclaimed the king. But he gave the princess to the young man to be his bride, and they lived happily together. And thus did Humpty Dumpty, even in his death, repay the kindness of the fair girl who had shown him such sights as an egg seldom sees. End of Humpty Dumpty All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christiane Levesque from Two Girls on a Podcast at Two Girls on a Podcast. .com. The Woman Who Lived in the Shoe from Mother Goose in Prose by L. Frank Baum. The Woman Who Lived in a Shoe. There was an old woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many children. She didn't know what to do. She gave them some broth without any bread, and whipped them all soundly, and sent them to bed. A long time ago there lived a woman who had four daughters, and these in time grew up and married and went to live in different parts of the country. And the woman, after that, lived all alone, and said to herself, I have done my duty to the world, and now shall rest quietly for the balance of my life. When one has raised a family of four children, and has married them all happily, she is surely entitled to pass her remaining days in peace and comfort. She lived in a peculiar little house that looked something like this picture. It was not like most of the houses you see, but the old woman had it built herself and liked it, and so it did not matter to her how odd it was. It stood upon the top of a little hill, and there was a garden at the back, and had a pretty green lawn in front with white gravel paths and many beds of bright-colored flowers. The old woman was very happy and contented there until one day she received a letter saying that her daughter Hannah was dead and had sent her family of five children to their grandmother to be taken care of. This misfortune ruined all the old woman's dreams of quiet, but the next day the children arrived, three boys and two girls, and she made the best of it and gave them the beds her own daughters had once occupied and her own cot as well and she made a bed for herself on the parlor sofa. The youngsters were like all other children and got into mischief once in a while, but the old woman had much experience with children and managed to keep them in order very well, while they quickly learned to obey her, and generally did as they were bid. But scarcely had she succeeded in getting them settled in their new home when Margaret, another of her daughters, died, and sent four more children to her mother to be taken care of. The old woman scarcely knew where to keep this new flock that had come to her fold, for the house was already full, but she thought the matter over and finally decided she must build an addition to her house. So she hired a carpenter and built what is called a lean-to at the right of her cottage, making it just big enough to accommodate the four new members of her family. When it was completed, her house looked very much like it does in this picture. She put four little cots in her new part of the house, and then she sighed contentedly and said, Now all the babies are taken care of and will be comfortable until they grow up. 
Of course, it was much more difficult to manage nine small children than five, and they often led each other into mischief, so that the flower beds began to be trampled upon, and the green grass to be worn under the constant tread of little feet, and the furniture to show a good many scratches and bruises. But the old woman continued to look after them, as well as she was able, until Sarah, her third daughter, also died, and three more children were sent to their grandmother to be brought up. The old woman was nearly distracted when she heard of this new addition to her family, but she did not give way to despair. She sent for the carpenter again, and had him built another addition to her house, as the picture shows. Then she put three new cots in the new part for the babies to sleep in, and when they arrived they were just as cozy and comfortable as peas in a pod. The grandmother was a lively old woman for one of her years but she found her time now fully occupied in cooking the meals for her twelve small grandchildren and mending their clothes and washing their faces and undressing them at night and dressing them in the morning there was just a dozen of babies now and when you consider they were about the same age you will realize what a large family the old woman had and how fully her time was occupied in caring for them all and now to make the matter worse her fourth daughter who had been named abigail suddenly took sick and died and she also had four small children that must be cared for in some way. The old woman, having taken the other twelve, could not well refuse to adopt these little orphans also. "'I may as well have sixteen as a dozen,' she said with a sigh. "'They will drive me crazy some day anyhow, so a few more will not matter at all.' Once more she sent for the carpenter, and bade him build a third addition to the house. And when it was completed, she added four more cots to the dozen that were already in use. The house presented a very queer appearance now, but she did not mind that so long as the babies were comfortable. "'I shall not have to build again,' she said, "'and that is one satisfaction. I have now no more daughters to die and leave me their children, and therefore I must make up my mind to do the best I can with the sixteen that have already been inflicted upon me in my old age.' It was not long before all the grass about the house was trodden down, and the white gravel of the walks all thrown at the birds, and the flower beds trampled into shapeless masses by thirty-two little feet that ran about from morn till night. But the old woman did not complain at this. Her time was too much taken up with the babies for her to miss the grass and the flowers. It cost so much money to clothe them that she decided to dress them all alike, so that they looked like the children of a regular orphan asylum and it cost so much to feed them that she was obliged to give them the plainest food. So there was bread and milk for breakfast, and milk and bread for dinner, and bread and broth for supper. But it was a good and wholesome diet, and the children thrived and grew fat upon it. One day a stranger came along the road, and when he saw the old woman's house he began to laugh. "'What are you laughing at, sir?' asked the grandmother, who was sitting upon her doorstep, engaged in mending sixteen pairs of stockings. "'At your house,' the stranger replied. "'It looks for all the world like a big shoe.' "'A shoe,' she said in surprise. "'Why, yes. The chimneys are the shoe straps, and the steps are the heel, and all those additions make up the foot of the shoe.' "'Never mind,' said the woman.' It may be a shoe, but it is full of babies, and that makes it differ from most other shoes. But the stranger went on to the village and told all he met that he had seen an old woman who lived in a shoe, and soon people came from all parts of the country to look at the queer house, and they usually went away laughing. The old woman did not mind this at all. She was too busy to be angry. Some of the children were always getting bumped heads or bruised shins, or falling down and hurting themselves, and these had to be comforted and some were naughty and had to be whipped and some were dirty and had to be washed and some were good and had to be kissed it was grandma do this and grandma do that from morning to night so that the poor grandmother was nearly distracted the only peace she ever got was when they were all safely tucked in their little cots and were sound asleep for then at least she was free from worry and had a chance to gather her scattered wits there are so many children, she said one day to the baker man, that I often really don't know what to do. If they were mine, ma'am, he replied, I'd send them to the poorhouse, or else they'd send me to the madhouse. Some of the children heard him say this, and they resolved to play him a trick in return for his ill-natured speech. 
the baker man came every day to the shoe house and brought two great baskets of bread in his arms for the children to eat with their milk and their broth so one day when the old woman had gone to town to buy shoes the children all painted their faces to look as indians do when they are on the war-path and they caught the roosters and the turkey-cock and pulled feathers from their tails to stick in their hair and then the boys made wooden tomahawks for the girls and bows and arrows for their own use and then all sixteen went out and hid in the bushes near the top of the hill by and by the baker man came slowly up the path with a basket of bread on either arm and just as he reached the bushes there sounded in his ears the most unearthly war-hoop then a flight of arrows came from the bushes and although they were blunt and could do him no harm they rattled all over his body and one hit his nose and another his chin while several stuck fast in the loaves of bread altogether the baker man was terribly frightened and when all the sixteen small indians rushed from the bushes and flourished their tomahawks he took to his heels and ran down the hill as fast as he could go when the grandmother returned she asked where is the bread for your supper the children looked at one another in surprise for they had forgotten all about the bread and then one of them confessed and told her the whole story of how they had frightened the baker man for saying he would send them to the poorhouse you are sixteen very naughty children exclaimed the old woman and for punishment you must eat your broth without any bread and afterwards each one shall have a sound whipping and be sent to bed then all the children began to cry at once and there was such an uproar that their grandmother had to put cotton in her ears that she might not lose her hearing but she kept her promise and made them eat their broth without any bread for indeed there was no bread to give them then she stood them in a row and undressed them and as she put the night-dress on each one she gave it a sound whipping and sent it to bed they cried some of course but they knew very well they deserved the punishment and it was not long before all of them were sound asleep they took care not to play any more tricks on the baker man and as they grew older they were naturally much better behaved before many years the boys were old enough to work for the neighboring farmers and that made the woman's family a good deal smaller and then the girls grew up and married and found homes of their own so that all the children were in time well provided for but not one of them forgot the kind grandmother who had taken such good care of them and often they tell their children of the days when they lived with the old woman in a shoe and frightened the baker man almost into fits with their wooden tomahawks End of The Woman Who Lived in a Shoe